Hello everyone, James Webb here. This is Cinema Web. Welcome to the new and improved Cinema Web Season 2. Today I'll be introducing you to an incredibly obscure film titled Guzo, The Thing Forsaken by God, Part 1. I guess, I guess Guzo. Uh, Guzu? They actually never pronounce the name of the creature through the entire course of the film. Uh, and the VHS box art and the opening crawl all type the name out in all caps in English. So uh, your guess is as good as mine. Now Guzo, that's how I'm going to pronounce it for the rest of this review, was a film shot on video in 1986 and released directly to VHS in Japan, which makes it classified as V-Cinema. Guzo is kind of fascinating because it's obviously ambitious. After all, they did call it Part 1, which implies the potential existence of future parts. Uh, that's always a sign of ambition. Despite that, the director was unable to surpass a very short 40-minute runtime, which is definitely too long for a short film, but is not exactly feature-length either. He could, did not run out of money to buy film because it, it wasn't shot on film, it was shot on tape. Uh, it's not like he didn't have enough story to tell, because he starts the entire thing off with several paragraphs of text slowly crawling across the screen, which he could have definitely very cheaply filmed that exposition instead of having massive exposition dump. Uh, oh, and in case you're wondering, no, of course there's no part two. There's no part two at all. Initially, I thought, and I think almost anybody would think, that it's some kind of plucky, in-over-his-head director who's shooting way above his budget, but a little bit over his head. But the feature shows a certain level of talent, and later on, the director gets to go and move on to bigger and better and higher budgeted features. Of course, those assumptions are totally wrong. This film was directed by Gaira, who is a not famous, but somewhat infamous director who's known for making some pretty grimy, sleazy movies. Now, that may sound like I'm bagging on him, but uh, his pin name is Gaira. He named himself after uh, this Toho monster. You don't do that if you don't kind of know what movies you're making. Additionally, the film was not his first. It lands right in the middle of his filmography. In fact, weirdly, it is the third V-Cinema release. That's right, third V-Cinema release of that year from Gaira. Uh, the other two are the considerably more famous... Entrails of a Virgin and Entrails of a Beautiful Woman. Yeah, definitely not what we're going to talk about today, and probably we will not be reviewing those in the future. Now, knowing that he made these two erotic films that are filled with extreme violence, you might be surprised at the actual content of Guzo. So... Now is as good of time to any to talk about our content warnings. Guzo content warnings include three violent, elaborate deaths, four Japanese schoolgirls, a un completely uncountable number of tentacles, and surprisingly nothing erotic. L literally, there are there's nothing erotic in this movie at all. Nice. Now, this film is a special effects movie. That means the whole reason that you would watch it is definitely to see the monster effects and deaths. Shying away from those would definitely be doing the movie a disservice and would 
make it difficult for more people to enjoy the film. So, I will be showing some fairly graphic scenes. For our more sensitive viewers, we have installed a warning bell into this review. So when you hear this sound, that means please avert your eyes if you're among our more sensitive viewers. Then afterwards, you'll hear this tone, which means you can continue watching. Now, Guzo opens with, as I mentioned before, a very slow crawl explaining what Guzo is. Uh, he's some kind of ancient creature left out of the history books because he's too mean-spirited and vile. Also, he has the ability to change his cellular structure to mimic creatures that are below him in the evolutionary scale. That's just the thing! Now, as much as that sounds like the thing, except an ancient creature instead of uh, some kind of alien, it does not use that shape-shifting ability. In fact, it has a different, far more important ability that should have been in the crawl, but wasn't. Uh, we'll find out about it a little bit later. Next, we meet our four main characters. They are four Japanese schoolgirls who are going into the mountains to stay at a professor's house. They talk about the professor, but I'm not totally clear on what the relationship they have with the professor is. So, mm, eh. living and performing research in the house is a scientist who has Guzo in the basement. How did she get Guzo in the basement? I don't know. I have no idea at all. Also, her personality is unusual. Now, usually in a horror movie like this, the dynamic is really easy to understand. A scientist has a mysterious creature in the basement, some schoolgirls or teenagers come and stay with him, and he feeds them to the creature one by one over the course of the movie, eventually killed by his own creation. You know, that's how the movie normally would go. In this case, the scientist is actually trying to protect the girls from Guzo, which makes you wonder, why didn't she just say, no, you cannot stay in this house. I'm doing experiments. It's dangerous. Apparently, she does not do that, but she spends most of the movie's runtime trying to keep the girls from getting eaten. Uh, kind of a weird dynamic, really. Anyway, we finally get our first view of Guzo himself, but the girl is safe. Then she almost goes into the basement, but the scientist turns her away. The scientist is very insistent that the girl stay out of the basement because she's doing experiments down there, and she's apparently using a flute to keep Guzo calm. Now, while the girls are frolicking down at the pool, yeah, this house has a pool, and while the girls are frolicking down at the pool, the scientist goes through their bags and smashes all of their compact mirrors in a scene that probably should not have been a long take because the scientist seems to have some trouble smashing those mirrors. In the meantime, one of the girls gets a cut, and some weird stuff happens with the blood. They try to figure out what cut her, and what? There's a mirror in the bottom of the pool. There's also mirrors hanging in the woods, and like by the river? Uh, what's going on? A weird plot point. That's what's going on. Uh, remember that text crawl that talked about the shape-shifting? What? it failed to mention was that Guzo can travel through mirrors. Yeah, that's a plot point I would have much rather have had in my text crawl, the ability he uses the entire movie. The other strange thing about this is, so our scientist knows Guzo can travel through the mirrors. She smashed the girl's compact mirrors, so she knows about that ability. 
So why are there mirrors hung up all over the property? Shouldn't she have taken the mirrors off the wall? Why did she hang mirrors in the forest in the first place? Did Guzo do that? That definitely doesn't track. Like, how did... She could... Is it for Guzo to hunt for his own food through the mirror? That doesn't make sense. She feeds him. They have a scene of her feeding him. Anyway, this girl gets dragged around by Guzo a bit, and it bites her face? What's that about? And then, notice a small detail about this scene. The scientist quickly grabs the keys off of the wall that she's hung next to a mirror. The keys to the monster in the basement next to a mirror and the monster has the ability to reach through mirrors. Is she really a scientist? Anyway, the scientist says the girl must have been attacked by a bat or something like that and then puts the girls back to bed. Um, really, if she's concerned about their safety, she should definitely send them home at this point. Of course, instead, the next morning, she goes off to town and the girls ride a bike in the forest, leaving their somewhat injured friend in bed. Of course, their injured friend decides they should definitely investigate this strange monster all by themselves. Oh, oh, don't do that. Ow. No. Okay. And then into the mirror she goes. Well, right there. That's that's the thing right there, isn't it? Basically the same effect they used in this thing, except it's not taking her form, so okay. Of course, later the girls are unable to find their friend and they become worried, so they hold down the scientist and take the keys out of her pocket. She's really not doing a good job keeping these girls safe, is she? And now it's time for my second favorite scene of the movie. She opens the door and whoa, whoa. What is this? Uh, is the basement in another dimension? Uh, I mean, the layout of the house definitely does not make sense. Uh, you'll notice that again later on in the movie, but it's still an incredibly goofy looking scene, and I love it. That's my sec again, my second favorite scene in the entire movie. And the monster looks kind of hilarious here. Yikes. Oh, yikes. The scientist somehow got free, but she was definitely too late to save the girl. And then, of course, after that, the monster breaks out of the basement. Uh, I mean, why didn't it do this before? And... There goes the anthropologist. After that, the girls go to escape. Wait, where are they? This is under the house. How could this possibly be under the... They're in a warehouse somehow. Oh, back to the house. Okay. Now that we get a full view of Guzo in the light, shuffling around, it's a little bit funny. Uh, it looks kind of like a hermit crab with no shell or something like that. He's a little bit goofy, but they do some cool effects to try to make him look like he's a lot faster than he is. Some of the footage is reversed. It looks like they, they kicked the puppet down the stairs and just played their footage in reverse to make him quickly climb up the stairs, which is uh, kind of cool, actually. And of course, after getting cornered in a small room, 
the girls discover that the flute calms Guzo down, which means it's time for my absolute favorite scene. Look how goofy this looks. They're in such an awkward and weird position, and the girls just playing the flute with the tentacles flailing about. It's just so bizarre. After Guzo is weakened by the flute, I don't know, is Guzo weak to the flute or is he calmed down by the flute? It's not clear. It definitely seems like before the scientist woman was playing the music to calm Guzo down. However, when the girls play it, it seems like they defeated him somehow. So I don't know what the Guzo flute rules happen to be. Of course, from some more reversed footage, Guzo uses his shape-shifting ability for the very first time, turning into a turtle and... How did he get outside? Could he have... Could he have just done that the whole time? Couldn't he have turned into a turtle and walked in... Couldn't he have turned into a woman and walked out of... It's okay. Of course, then the girls pick him up on their way out because they think the poor turtle has lost his family somehow. The house didn't explode. How would the turtle have lost his family? How did he get outside? And with that, part one is finished. Part two does not exist. Now, of course, Guzo's got some serious flaws. Its story definitely has some weak points and there's a lot of logic that doesn't quite line up but I know is in service of getting the characters into the right positions to kill them by Guzo. It's special effects driven that's kind of the point. It doesn't completely excuse the writing but I kind of understand at the same time. It also, while an impressive puppet, does have limited mobility, so it uses the common 80s monsters, we built this puppet, but we don't know how to get it to move enough to look actually threatening, let's give it some tentacles. The Kindred did it. The Suckling did it. Some others probably did it too. Maybe we'll talk about those guys another day. Unfortunately, Guzo is basically unavailable. It was released on VHS back in 1986 in Japan and was never released outside of the territory. It's a low-budget V-Cinema. Uh, personally, I would love to see one of the Blu-ray companies gather up a bunch of these shot-on-video, short, grotesque horror movies and throw them all on like a Blu-ray collection. Uh, there's a few more like this, other kind of weird experimental gore films basically that were just special effects showcases released directly to VHS. I'd love for those to get like cataloged somewhere or something like that but it's pretty hard to find information about them. I hope all my viewers out there enjoyed looking at this weird rare gem. Uh, please like and subscribe if you've enjoyed this video and I hope we'll see you next time.